Chapter 32 Snares of Satan The great controversy between Christ and Satan that has been carried forward for nearly six thousand years is soon to close, and the wicked one redoubles his efforts to defeat the work of Christ in man's behalf and to fasten souls in his snares, to hold the people in darkness and impenitence till the Savior's mediation is ended and there is no longer a sacrifice for sin, is the object which he seeks to accomplish. When there is no special effort made to resist his power, when indifference prevails in the church and the world, Satan is not concerned, for he is in no danger of losing those whom he is leading captive at his will. But when the attention is called to eternal things, and souls are inquiring what must I do to be saved, he is on the ground, seeking to match his power against the power of Christ and to counteract the influence of the Holy Spirit. The Scriptures declare that upon one occasion when the angels of God came to present themselves before the Lord, Satan came also among them, not to bow before the eternal King, but to further his own malicious designs against the righteous. With the same object, he is in attendance when men assemble for the worship of God. Though hidden from sight, he is working with all diligence to control the minds of the worshippers. Like a skillful general, he lays his plans beforehand. As he sees the messenger of God searching the scriptures, he takes note of the subject to be presented to the people. Then he employs all his cunning and shrewdness so to control circumstances that the message may not reach those whom he is deceiving on that very point. The one who most needs the warning will be urged into some business transaction which requires his presence, or will by some other means be prevented from hearing the words that might prove to him a savor of life unto life. Again, Satan sees the Lord's servants burdened because of the spiritual darkness that enshrouds the people. He hears their earnest prayers for divine grace and power to break the spell of indifference, carelessness, and indolence, Then with renewed zeal he plies his arts. He tempts men to the indulgence of appetite or to some other form of self-gratification, and thus benumbs their sensibilities so that they fail to hear the very things which they most need to learn. Satan well knows that all whom he can lead to neglect prayer and searching of the Scriptures will be overcome by his attacks. Therefore, he invents every possible device to engross the mind. There has ever been a class professing godliness who, instead of following on to know the truth, make it their religion to seek some fault of character or error of faith in those with whom they do not agree. Such are Satan's right-hand helpers. Accusers of the brethren are not few, and they are always active when God is at work and his servants are rendering him true homage. They will put a false coloring upon the words and acts of those who love and obey the truth. They will represent the most earnest, zealous, self-denying servants of Christ as deceived or deceivers. It is their work to misrepresent the motives of every true and noble deed, to circulate insinuations, and arouse suspicion in the minds of the inexperienced. In every conceivable manner, they will seek to cause that which is pure and righteous to be regarded as foul and deceptive. But none need be deceived concerning them. It may be readily seen whose children they are, whose example they follow, and whose work they do. You shall know them by their fruits, Matthew 7, verse 16. Their course resembles that of Satan, the envenomed slanderer. The Accuser of Our Brethren, Revelation 12, verse 10. The great deceiver has many agents ready to present any and every kind of error to ensnare souls, heresies prepared to suit the varied tastes and capacities of those whom he would ruin. It is his plan to bring into the church insincere, unregenerate elements that will encourage doubt and unbelief, and hinder all who desire to see the work of God advance and to advance with it. Many who have no real faith in God or in His Word assent 
to some principles of truth and pass as Christians, and thus they are enabled to introduce their errors as scriptural doctrines. The position that it is of no consequence what men believe is one of Satan's most successful deceptions. He knows that the truth, received in the love of it, sanctifies the soul of the receiver. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to substitute false theories, fables, another gospel. From the beginning, the servants of God have contended against false teachers not merely as vicious men, but as inculcators of falsehoods that were fatal to the soul. Elijah, Jeremiah, Paul firmly and fearlessly opposed those who were turning men from the Word of God. That liberality which regards a correct religious faith as unimportant found no favor with these holy defenders of the truth. The vague and fanciful interpretations of Scripture and the many conflicting theories concerning religious faith that are found in the Christian world are the work of our great adversary to confuse minds so that they shall not discern the truth. And the discord and division which exist among the churches of Christendom are in a great measure due to the prevailing custom of resting the Scriptures to support a favorite theory. Instead of carefully studying God's Word with humility of heart to obtain a knowledge of His will, many seek only to discover something odd or original. In order to sustain erroneous doctrines or unchristian practices, some will seize upon passages of Scripture separated from the context, perhaps quoting half of a single verse as proving their point, when the remaining portion would show the meaning to be quite the opposite. With the cunning of the serpent they entrench themselves behind disconnected utterances, construed to suit their carnal desires. Thus do many willfully pervert the word of God. Others, who have an active imagination, seize upon the figures and symbols of holy writ, interpret them to suit their fancy, with little regard to the testimony of Scripture as its own interpreter, and then they present their vagaries as the teachings of the Bible. Whenever the study of the Scriptures is entered upon without a prayerful, humble, teachable spirit, the plainest and simplest, as well as the most difficult passages, will be wrested from their true meaning. The papal leaders select such portions of Scripture as best serve their purpose, interpret it to suit themselves, and then present these to the people, while they deny them the privilege of studying the Bible and understanding its sacred truths for themselves. The whole Bible should be given to the people just as it reads. It would be better for them not to have Bible instruction at all than to have the teaching of the Scriptures thus grossly misrepresented. The Bible was designed to be a guide to all who wish to become acquainted with the will of their Maker. God gave to men the sure word of prophecy. Angels and even Christ himself came to make known to Daniel and John the things that must shortly come to pass. Those important matters that concern our salvation were not left involved in mystery. They were not revealed in such a way as to perplex and mislead the honest seeker after truth. Said the Lord by the prophet Habakkuk, Write the vision and make it plain, that he may run that readeth it. Habakkuk 2, verse 2. The word of God is plain to all who study it with a prayerful heart. Every truly honest soul will come to the light of truth. Light is sown for the righteous, Psalm 97, verse 11. And no church can advance in holiness unless its members are earnestly seeking for truth as for hid treasure. By the cry, liberality, men are blinded to the devices of their adversary while he is all the time working steadily for the accomplishment of his object. As he succeeds in supplanting the Bible by human speculations, the law of God is set aside, and the churches are under the bondage of sin while they claim to be free. To many, scientific research has become a curse. God has permitted a flood of light to be poured upon the world in discoveries in science and art, but even the greatest minds, 
if not guided by the Word of God in their research, become bewildered in their attempts to investigate the relations of science and revelation. Human knowledge of both material and spiritual things is partial and imperfect. Therefore, many are unable to harmonize their views of science with Scripture statements. Many accept mere theories and speculations as scientific facts, and they think that God's Word is to be tested by the teachings of science falsely so called. 1 Timothy 6, verse 20. The Creator and His works are beyond their comprehension, and because they cannot explain these by natural laws, Bible history is regarded as unreliable. Those who doubt the reliability of the records of the Old and New Testaments too often go a step further and doubt the existence of God and attribute infinite power to nature. Having let go their anchor, they are left to beat about upon the rocks of infidelity. Thus many err from the faith and are seduced by the devil. Men have endeavored to be wiser than their Creator. Human philosophy has attempted to search out and explain mysteries which will never be revealed through the eternal ages. If men would but search and understand what God had made known of Himself and His purposes, they would obtain such a view of the glory, majesty, and power of Jehovah that they would realize their own littleness and would be content with that which has been revealed for themselves and their children. It is a masterpiece of Satan's deceptions to keep the minds of men searching and conjecturing in regard to that which God has not made known, and which he does not intend that we shall understand. It was thus that Lucifer lost his place in heaven. He became dissatisfied because all the secrets of God's purposes were not confided to him, and he entirely disregarded that which was revealed concerning his own work in the lofty position assigned him. By arousing the same discontent in the angels under his command, he caused their fall. Now he seeks to imbue the minds of men with the same spirit, and to lead them also to disregard the direct commands of God. Those who are unwilling to accept the plain cutting truths of the Bible are continually seeking for pleasing fables that will quiet the conscience. The less spiritual, self-denying, and humiliating the doctrines presented, the greater the favor with which they are received. These persons degrade the intellectual powers to serve their carnal desires. Too wise in their own conceit to search the Scriptures with contrition of soul and earnest prayer for divine guidance, they have no shield from delusion. Satan is ready to supply the heart's desire, and he palms off his deceptions in the place of truth. It was thus that the papacy gained its power over the minds of men, and by rejection of the truth, because it involves a cross, Protestants are following the same path. All who neglect the word of God to study convenience and policy, that they may not be at variance with the world, will be left to receive damnable heresy for religious truth. Every conceivable form of error will be accepted by those who willfully reject the truth. He who looks with horror upon one deception will readily receive another. The Apostle Paul, speaking of a class who received not the love of the truth that they might be saved, declares, For this cause God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 through 12. With such a warning before us, it behooves us to be on our guard as to what doctrines we receive. Among the most successful agencies of the great deceiver are the delusive teachings and lying wonders of spiritualism. Disguised as an angel of light, he spreads his nets where least suspected. If men would but study the word of God with earnest prayer that they might understand it, they would not be left in darkness to receive false doctrines. But as they reject the truth, they fall a prey to deception. 
Another dangerous error is the doctrine that denies the deity of Christ, claiming that he had no existence before his advent to this world. This theory is received with favor by a large class who profess to believe the Bible, yet it directly contradicts the plainest statements of our Savior concerning his relationship with the Father, his divine character, and his preexistence. It cannot be entertained without the most unwarranted resting of the Scriptures. It not only lowers man's conceptions of the work of redemption, but undermines faith in the Bible as a revelation from God. While this renders it the more dangerous, it makes it also harder to meet. If men reject the testimony of the inspired Scriptures concerning the deity of Christ, it is in vain to argue the point with them for no argument, however conclusive, could convince them. The natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14 None who hold this error can have a true conception of the character or the mission of Christ, or of the great plan of God for man's redemption. Still, another subtle and mischievous error is the fast-spreading belief that Satan has no existence as a personal being, that the name is used in Scripture merely to represent men's evil thoughts and desires. The teaching so widely echoed from popular pulpits that the second advent of Christ is his coming to each individual at death is a device to divert the minds of men from his personal coming in the clouds of heaven. For years, Satan has thus been saying, Behold, he is in the secret chambers, and many souls have been lost by accepting this deception. Again, worldly wisdom teaches that prayer is not essential. Men of science claim that there can be no real answer to prayer, that this would be a violation of law, a miracle, and that miracles have no existence. The universe, say they, is governed by fixed laws, and God himself does nothing contrary to these laws. Thus they represent God as bound by his own laws, as if the operation of divine laws could exclude divine freedom. Such teaching is opposed to the testimony of the Scriptures. Were not miracles wrought by Christ and his apostles? The same compassionate Savior lives today and he is as willing to listen to the prayer of faith as when he walked visibly among men. The natural cooperates with the supernatural. It is a part of God's plan to grant us, in answer to the prayer of faith, that which he would not bestow did we not thus ask. Innumerable are the erroneous doctrines and fanciful ideas that are obtaining among the churches of Christendom. It is impossible to estimate the evil results of removing one of the landmarks fixed by the Word of God. Few who venture to do this stop with the rejection of a single truth. The majority continue to set aside one after another of the principles of truth until they become actual infidels. The errors of popular theology have driven many a soul to skepticism who might otherwise have been a believer in the Scriptures. It is impossible for him to accept doctrines which outrage his sense of justice, mercy, and benevolence, and since these are represented as the teaching of the Bible, he refuses to receive it as the Word of God. And this is the object which Satan seeks to accomplish. There is nothing that he desires more than to destroy confidence in God and in his Word. Satan stands at the head of the great army of doubters, and he works to the utmost of his power to beguile souls into his ranks. It is becoming fashionable to doubt. There is a large class by whom the word of God is looked upon with distrust for the same reason as was its author, because it reproves and condemns sin. Those who are unwilling to obey its requirements endeavor to overthrow its authority. They read the Bible, or listen to its teachings as presented from the sacred desk, merely to find fault with the scriptures or with the sermon. 
Not a few become infidels in order to justify or excuse themselves in neglect of duty. Others adopt skeptical principles from pride and indolence. Too ease loving to distinguish themselves by accomplishing anything worthy of honor which requires effort and self denial, they aim to secure a reputation for superior wisdom by criticizing the Bible. There is much which the finite mind, unenlightened by divine wisdom, is powerless to comprehend, and thus they find occasion to criticize. There are many who seem to feel that it is a virtue to stand on the side of unbelief, skepticism, and infidelity. But underneath an appearance of candor, it will be found that such persons are actuated by self-confidence and pride. Many delight in finding something in the Scriptures to puzzle the minds of others. Some at first criticize and reason on the wrong side from a mere love of controversy. They do not realize that they are thus entangling themselves in the snare of the fowler. But having openly expressed unbelief, they feel that they must maintain their position. Thus they unite with the ungodly and close to themselves the gates of paradise. God has given in His Word sufficient evidence of its divine character. The great truths which concern our redemption are clearly presented. By the aid of the Holy Spirit, which is promised to all who seek it in sincerity, every man may understand these truths for himself. God has granted to men a strong foundation upon which to rest their faith. Yet the finite minds of men are inadequate fully to comprehend the plans and purposes of the Infinite One. We can never, by searching, find out God. We must not attempt to lift with presumptuous hand the curtain behind which He veils His majesty. The Apostle exclaims, How unsearchable are His judgments, and His ways past finding out! Romans 11, verse 33. We can so far comprehend His dealings with us, and the motives by which He is actuated, that we may discern boundless love and mercy united to infinite power. Our Father in heaven orders everything in wisdom and righteousness, and we are not to be dissatisfied and distrustful, but to bow in reverent submission. He will reveal to us as much of His purposes as it is for our good to know. And beyond that, we must trust the hand that is omnipotent, the heart that is full of love. While God has given ample evidence for faith, He will never remove all excuse for unbelief. All who look for hooks to hang their doubts upon will find them. And those who refuse to accept and obey God's word until every objection has been removed, and there is no longer an opportunity for doubt, will never come to the light. Distrust of God is the natural outgrowth of the unrenewed heart, which is at enmity with Him. But faith is inspired by the Holy Spirit, and it will flourish only as it is cherished. No man can become strong in faith without a determined effort. Unbelief strengthens as it is encouraged and if men, instead of dwelling upon the evidences which God has given to sustain their faith, permit themselves to question and cavil, they will find their doubts constantly becoming more confirmed. But those who doubt God's promises and distrust the assurance of His grace are dishonoring Him, and their influence, instead of drawing others to Christ, tends to repel them from Him. They are unproductive trees, that spread their dark branches far and wide, shutting away the sunlight from other plants and causing them to droop and die under the chilling shadow. The life work of these persons will appear as a never-ceasing witness against them. They are sowing seeds of doubt and skepticism that will yield an unfailing harvest. There is but one course for those to pursue who honestly desire to be freed from doubts, Instead of questioning and caviling concerning that which they do not understand, let them give heed to the light which already shines upon them, and they will receive greater light. 
Let them do every duty which has been made plain to their understanding, and they will be enabled to understand and perform those of which they are now in doubt. Satan can present a counterfeit so closely resembling the truth that it deceives those who are willing to be deceived, who desire to shun the self-denial and sacrifice demanded by the truth. But it is impossible for him to hold under his power one soul who honestly desires at whatever cost to know the truth. Christ is the truth, and the light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. John 1, verse 9. The Spirit of truth has been sent to guide men into all truth. And upon the authority of the Son of God it is declared, Seek, and ye shall find. If any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine. Matthew 7, verse 7, John 7, verse 17. The followers of Christ know little of the plots which Satan and his hosts are forming against them. But he who sitteth in the heavens will overrule all these devices for the accomplishment of his deep designs. The Lord permits his people to be subjected to the fiery ordeal of temptation, not because he takes pleasure in their distress and affliction, but because this process is essential to their final victory. He could not, consistently with his own glory, shield them from temptation, for the very object of the trial is to prepare them to resist all the allurements of evil. Neither wicked men nor devils can hinder the work of God or shut out his presence from his people, if they will, with subdued, contrite hearts, confess and put away their sins and in faith claim his promises. Every temptation, every opposing influence, whether open or secret, may be successfully resisted, not by might, nor by power, but by my Spirit, saith the Lord of hosts. Zechariah 4, verse 6. The eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. And who is he that will harm you, if you be followers of that which is good? 1 Peter 3, verses 12 and 13. When Balaam, allured by the promise of rich rewards, practiced enchantments against Israel, and by sacrifices to the Lord sought to invoke a curse upon his people, the Spirit of God forbade the evil which he longed to pronounce, and Balaam was forced to exclaim, How shall I curse whom God hath not cursed? Or how shall I defy whom the Lord hath not defied? Let me die the death of the righteous, and let my last end be like his. When sacrifice had again been offered, the ungodly prophet declared, Behold, I have received commandment to bless, and he hath blessed, and I cannot reverse it. He hath not beheld iniquity in Jacob, neither hath he seen perverseness in Israel. The Lord his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. Surely there is no enchantment against Jacob, neither is there any divination against Israel. According to this time it shall be said of Jacob and of Israel, What hath God wrought? Yet a third time altars were erected, and again Balaam essayed to secure a curse. But from the unwilling lips of the prophet, the Spirit of God declared the prosperity of his chosen, and rebuked the folly and malice of their foes. Blessed is he that blesses thee, and cursed is he that curses thee. Numbers 23, verses 8, 10, 20, 21, 23, and chapter 24, verse 9. The people of Israel were at this time loyal to God, and so long as they continued in obedience to his law, no power in earth or hell could prevail against them. But the curse which Balaam had not been permitted to pronounce against God's people, he finally succeeded in bringing upon them by seducing them into sin. When they transgressed God's commandments, then they separated themselves from him, and they were left to feel the power of the destroyer. Satan is well aware that the weakest soul who abides in Christ is more than a match for the hosts of darkness, and that, should he reveal himself openly, 
he would be met and resisted. Therefore he seeks to draw away the soldiers of the cross from their strong fortification, while he lies in ambush with his forces ready to destroy all who venture upon his ground. Only in humble reliance upon God and obedience to all his commandments can we be secure. No man is safe for a day or an hour without prayer. Especially should we entreat the Lord for wisdom to understand his word. Here are revealed the wiles of the tempter and the means by which he may be successfully resisted. Satan is an expert in quoting scripture, placing his own interpretation upon passages by which he hopes to cause us to stumble. We should study the Bible with humility of heart, never losing sight of our dependence upon God. While we must constantly guard against the devices of Satan, we should pray in faith continually, Lead us not into temptation.